this. I thought we'd talk politics, right, because the world is, is nutty out there, and it's, uh, I don't know what the latest news is, but I'm assuming the Republicans are, ca are going to cave any, se any minute now, right, and uh, cut a deal to, uh, to, to get this over with. So I thought we'd talk a little bit about how we got into, into the condition that we are today. And I don't, I'm not going to talk a lot, so I thought we'd really open this up and, and have like a conversation, and, and I'll, take, I'll take questions, and uh, we'll do it that way. I, I don't think there are many people here I need to convince of anything. Um, it looks like I'm uh, pretty much uh, among friends. So uh, I'll just give you a sense of my take on what's going on in Washington, D.C., Right now, why we got into this, why we're in this mess, kind of in a broader perspective, and then just let's open it up and see what you guys want to talk about. And I'm, uh, I'm always, uh, I'm always game uh, for whatever people want to uh, want to discuss. The fundamental problem, you know, in American politics is that we have lost all sense of principle. There's no sense of what the role of government really should be. There's no political party today in, uh, in, in Washington that represents a principled position around limited government. And I'm not even talking about kind of a libertarian or an objectivist perspective of limited government. Any limited government, any limits of government. Uh, you know, the, so the Republican Party sold its soul to the statist agenda decades ago. Decades ago. Uh, and what we're seeing today is the con consequence of that. We're seeing two political parties, both with statist agendas, uh, one that wants to move to the left fast and one that wants to move to the left slow. But that's really the only fundamental difference between uh, these two parties. Now, I have a preference for slow over fast. I think we all do, because slow gives us time maybe to have an impact on the culture and, 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 and stop the move to the left, to the move to greater statism and, and shift other direction. But fundamentally, there is no political party that represents the founding principles of this country. There is, there are no, with, with a few exceptions that I mentioned in a minute, there are no political figures, no substantial political figures over the last decades that have stood for the founding principles of this country. And when you get a political figure like Barry Goldwater, he gets defeated in a landslide because he is the, close to being principled. And the country is not ready for that. And then you have a you have a, a political figure like Ronald Reagan, who's a little bit watered down from from Barry Goldwater, right? Who can get elected, but then can't do anything because nobody else agrees with any of these principles, and nothing really happens. And he gives a great speech, but he doesn't really execute on it. And then once he's out of the office, everything goes back to the same as it was, right? Government continues to grow at an ever growing rate. So. We have two political parties that are statist, and of course the reason for that is that we have a population that is statist. I mean, it, it, it's a mistake for us to believe that somehow all that's needed is some great politician to come about, and the country will rally around him, and, and everything is, uh, everything is uh, fantastic. The fact is that we have a population that doesn't know what the founding principles of this country are, that has no sense of what individual rights qua negative rights, qua the real definition of rights um, is. We have a population that's ignorant of history, that's ignorant of economics, and, uh, you know, it, it, the, the country's drifting leftwards because the country is leftwards. The country's drifting leftwards, not just the politicians. The politicians are following the people, and, and they're very much uh, caving in. I mean, even with Obamacare, the, all the polls show Obamacare is unpopular. But you know why it's unpopular? Because there's a certain fraction. Some people hate it because it's bigger government. But there's a fraction of that that hate it because it's not enough government. Because what they want is, is single-payer universal health care, and Obamacare doesn't give them that. It's too complicated. Right? They just want to go and get free health care, like, or, or free non-care, whatever you want to call it, like, like the Canadians and the Europeans get. <laughs> so it's not that there's a majority of the country who want a free market alternative to Obamacare. There isn't. There isn't. So what we're seeing today is the consequence of a country that has drifted dramatically leftward in its ideas, in its ideology. A country that is very much ignorant of the foundations of freedom and foundations of liberty. And this is why I still believe that the primary focus of any 
campaign for liberty has to be educational. It has to be educate people and change the culture. And the politics follows because the, the, the politics are reflecting that culture and the culture's left. It's e even among the Tea Party, right? So they're anti-Obamacare, but they will, they will fight to the death for socialized medicine for anybody over 65. It's called Medicaid, right? Most of them are over 65. Most of them are getting are recipients of this and they will fight for it, right? So e even the Tea Party, as much as energy as they have, and I'm a huge fan of the Tea Party, they need educating. They don't understand what liberty really means. They don't understand what freedom means. They don't understand what individual rights mean. And they, they, therefore, they're, they're completely inconsistent and all over the map, even on economic issues, which is their relative strength. Social issues is a disaster with them. Uh, so the, the, the political campaign is primarily, ultimately, a cultural educational campaign. And you cannot, you cannot get around that fact. Uh, now, we're in a period where, because of the Tea Party, we have some political leaders who I think are a little bit better on some issues that relate to rights, that relate to founding principles. Uh, whether it's a Rand Paul or a Ted Cruz or, or you know, a, a Lee from, from, uh, from Utah or, or Johnson from Wisconsin, they're somewhat better on the issues of economic rights. Uh, and they're fueled by a Tea Party movement that is that on certain issues is very adamant and very passionate and very engaged. And you get quite a few House members that are the same way. And they've chosen this moment in time to kind of stand up against Obamacare. Now, where have they been for the last three years? I don't know. But really to stand up and to, and to make this a big deal. Um, and it's refreshing, I have to say. I, I enjoy Ted Cruz's pseudo filibuster. I enjoy listening to them passionately advocate for this. Um, it's fun to see politicians who actually are taking a stand on something, even though the political costs might be negative. It, you, you know, to them, it might be hurtful. It's hard to tell. Republicans are not popular right now because of all this. Uh, and, and I think you're seeing a real, a, a real challenge there. You're seeing a few politicians who have some principles, some, not as many as we would like, but some. You're seeing a majority of the Republican Party, it's just traditional Republican Party, you have no clue about what a principle is, and they have no idea what Ted Cruz is talking about or what any of these guys are talking about, and they're just drifting along because these guys seem passionate and they get a lot of phone calls from Tea Party people, so they're just d being dragged along, uh, you know, into the shutdown and into all this stuff. And you have a population that I think mostly is confused, as we said, rel relatively ignorant, doesn't really understand the issues. You know, the Tea Party loves Ted Cruz, but for some good reasons, some not so good reasons, uh, and it's just a mess. It's a and it's and the consequence uh, that this is going to turn out to be a disaster for the Republicans because there's no strategy here. There's emotion, there's passion, there's a little bit of standing on principle, but there's no strategy, and there's not enough people involved to make any kind of real difference. They just the, the few people who are willing to stand up are too few. Uh, and uh, they will land up caving and get nothing in return. Or oh, what they get in return, they'll play it up and they'll pretend that it's meaningful, but it, it'll be meaningless. I mean, either the, the Senate compromise thing, I, yeah, I haven't seen if that was passed and I haven't seen a final version of it, but, you know, the one thing they could have got, one of the most stupidest, dumbest things in Obamacare was this 3% tax on uh, medical devices. I don't know if you know how familiar you are with it. It's 3% on revenue. It's not a profit. Basically, it takes out all the profit from these businesses that run on very slim margins anyway. And these are innovative, many of them are startups, right? And many of them don't have profits. And it's just, it's just the dumbest, stupidest idea ever. It's, it's just because from every perspective, even from the perspective of somebody trying to maximize social utility or trying to do some social welfare stuff, it just, it's just silly, right? You know, these are companies that are creating great products, new products, innovative products, uh, and it, you're destroying them. You're destroying them. And, and what's going to happen is the good companies are going to move overseas because the fact is the Europeans regulate less and tax less uh, innovative companies. So, you know, why stay in the U.S.? The Republicans won't even get that. I mean, that's already out of the Senate bill, and even the House Republicans, I think, have given up on that one. So, and the most they would get is a postponement of it, not a, not a complete rejection of it. So they've completely lost what they fought for. And this is a consequence of no 
real principles. So even Ted Cruz, right, he gives a great speech, and I, you know, he pitched out short during the speech. I have to respect him. I told everybody to go up and buy a copy, so that, that's great. But this, you know, to do something like this, shut down government for that cause, this, this uh, Obamacare, you should have been advocating for this, air, you know, speech after speech after speech for the last two, three years, right? Last year, Republicans ran a presidential candidate that couldn't talk about Obamacare because he invented it. It was called Romneycare. So it was nowhere in the, in, the, in the debate last year, right? So people have just accepted Obamacare is going to happen. And suddenly, out of nowhere, it comes out. So it, it, from a PR perspective, from a strategy perspective, this whole thing makes absolutely no sense. And, of course, the fact is Obama and the Democrats you know, control the Senate, they control the White House. What do the Republicans hope to get here? They're not going to win the PR battle because it, it's random. It's, it's a principle out of nowhere. They haven't laid the foundations for it. You know, the, the, they, they're not going to get anything from Obama because Obama has nothing to lose here. He's going to blame everything on the Republicans. I mean, I'm all for shutting down the government. Anytime you can shut down the government, it's a good thing, right? But you got to have good reasons to do it, right? Like, you know, how about privatizing national parks? I mean, that would be that should have been a, a big slogan of the Republicans. Once everybody was denied the national monuments and national parks, come out with a proposal to 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 uh, privatize them all, and that would solve uh, you know solve the problem of people now being able to come in when uh, when the federal government has no money to to run them. Propose something about the budget so they don't want to raise the limit, their limit, right? But every budget proposal that they've proposed that they put on the table raises the debt limit. So they come across as hypocrites, right? Oh, we won't raise the debt limit, but w w do you have a budget proposal that won't raise the debt limit? No, we would also raise the debt limit, just we would raise it a little bit less than the Democrats. It's just, it's just, it's, it's you know, unconvincing, unprincipled, uninteresting, and, and, you know, from a PR perspective, it's a complete loser. So... You know, they're, they're going to they're gonna capitulate, the government will open, they'll raise the debt limit, and they've got nothing to show for it, or they will have nothing to show for it. So, at the end of the day, this was probably a strategic disaster for them, in spite of the fact that I was inspired by a few people standing up and, and, and saying their piece. They, they could have done it so much better. And the problem is, you know, their unwillingness to define their principles. You know, because if they define their principles, they get into trouble. So even Ted Cruz, right, he could talk about Obamacare, but he would never mention Medicare, right? So what's the difference between Medicare and Obamacare? If you're against Obamacare, how can you be for Medicare? Medicare is just socialized medicine for 65-year-olds. What's the difference, right? So, and they know that. They know that if they strike an actual principle with regard to Obamacare, they actually stand on principle, they're going to be called out on Medicare. And they can't, because you know they they, they they fear that more than anything. I mean, uh, Paul Ryan has a modest proposal about vouchers for Medicare, which is good, which is a step in the right direction. And he was vilified as a monster by by the press and by the Democrats, and and the public's not buying it. So, at the end of the day, you know, while we've got better people in Washington on, on these economic issues, we've got some politicians that are actually making a much better case than has been in the past, it's still true that they cannot move anything forward as long as the American people are as ignorant and unconvinced as they are today. And I see no indication that they're engaging the kind of educational campaign that you would have to engage in in order to change the American people's minds. Um, one of the things I've been telling, I, I speak a lot in front of Tea Party groups and, and kind of conservative <laughs> Republican groups. And one of the things I think that, that people need to start considering is that it might be impossible to save the Republican Party. It might be impossible to actually bring principles into the Republican Party, use that as an educational platform and an electoral platform. And it might necessitate starting a third party that, that people should really think seriously about a, a third political party, partially because it will, you know, be fresh, right? Remember what, Ro well, you guys, some of you are too young, but what Ross Perot did, right? I mean, he was an uncharismatic little short guy who was not articulate. He, he, he didn't do good television. He sat at the desk with flip charts and flipped them over, and he got 20% of the vote. 
he got 20% of the vote because he, he, he looked at the camera and he told the Americans, he showed them the numbers and he told them the truth. And he used it as an educational platform. He actually educated Americans about, in those days, deficits and, and, uh, and debt, right? Things are a hundred times worse than they were in the early 90s. So it would be, and, and that was fresh, right? It, it wasn't just a Republican partisan doing it. It wasn't a Democrat partisan. It was something new or something different. And, and I seriously think that to change what's going on now, you need a shock to the system. You need something new. You need something different. And a third party led by the right people, it needs to be big, it needs to be big names and it has to have big money behind it. But the money, I think, is there if, if you get the right people. is probably the right path. And, you know, again, they're not going to be objectivist and they're not going to be libertarian. But if they're just more free market than what we have today and more principled, at least in, in making some time attempt to connect to the founders and really talk to the American people about what the real problems are, present alternatives. I think, I think it's, it's the only shot we have long term to, to save this country from the disaster that is the two-party system that we have right now. Um, so, you know, that's my assessment, kind of the, of the politics of it. I, you know, I... I don't see, um, I, unfortunately, I don't see a third party coming about. I think the, the, the people like Rand Paul and Ted Cruz and so on are too committed to the Republican Party to split off and do something interesting and exciting. And I don't see any major figure outside of politics who would take that on and really embrace it and can generate a, a national buzz in order to get something like that going. And I think, I think our campaign needs to continue to be one of education and one of education about the political foundations of this country. And more importantly, as probably many of you know, what we believe at the Institute is you're not going to really change things until there's a, there's a moral revolution, there's an ethical revolution in this country, until people are willing to, to reject uh, the, the morality of selflessness and the morality of you are your brother's keeper and your, your, your moral purpose in life is to serve others and on and on and and to embrace an individualistic moral theory and to, to, to embrace individualism and that should really be I think our, our campaign is is around individualism and it's a hook to the founders who are clearly individualists and it's a hook to a f moral foundations for individual rights and therefore moral foundations for limited government so uh, the, the struggle for individualism uh, must continue, and this is a long, it's going to be a long, drawn-out campaign to resurrect the spirit of individualism in this country. Tea parties is just the beginning of that, but it's going to have to sustain itself over the next couple of decades, uh, because that's probably about the time we have in order to win this. Uh, so uh, get energized. There's a lot of work to do, and there's a lot of educating to do, but that, at the end of the day, is what it's really about. Thank you all. No.